Um, this is the Flotilla Friday call, uh, September 24th, 2021. Um, we were just hitting uh, some FJB stuff. Uh, Mark Antoine and I wrote some code to read uh, the brain. Um, and uh, so far we've read Jerry's brain and Mark Trexler's climate web brain. Um, uh, Mark Antoine has a wonderful uh, database caching thing of that. Um, and Mark Carranza is interested in playing with that data. Um, Mark Carranza, I think maybe most people know here, but uh, Mark's got a, a knowledge system-ish thing that he calls uh, MX. Um, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, in the chat, I put, um, I'll, I'll do it again. I, uh, there's a HackMD page up um, with some things that we might want to talk about. And I can share screen on that, or we can keep looking at each other. I, I would bias towards looking at each other, but. So a little introduction to MX through, through my lens. Um, I was up at uh, UC Berkeley. I'm going to guess it's around 2003. Uh, and uh, we're sitting in a classroom getting ready to hear a talk or something. I don't remember the details. And Mark comes in and he's got this little tiny laptop. And uh, my, my friend who was with me, we were, we, I had just started at SRI International. My friend knew of Mark and he said, show us your outliner. And Mark sat down and he started talking about San Francisco and he brought up this outline and, and I was just blown away at how facile he was on the keyboard at remembering everything by walking around in this outliner. Um, he and I, Mark and I, then in a Google, uh, one of the, you, you may recall back in the heyday, uh, Google would, would uh, bring people over and let you sleep overnight and, and, and give you all kinds of food and so on and so forth. And they'd call these things hackathons. And Mark and I built a, a version of MX that, that ran on, on a, a Google app. And, and that was my, my internal introduction to MX. So we, when you get a chance to see it in action, it's pretty amazing. And I'll happily put that off or do it at any particular. Um, uh, yeah, have you recorded any screen cap of you using MX, Mark? Is there like other YouTube videos that I can go watch of you just sort of actively using it? I haven't looked, but it would be great to have a, an intro that way. Because when you post your shared notes, I don't know what to make of them. Uh, you're muted again. Yeah. Uh, I do understand that if I search in Google Mark Carranza and click on videos, there are videos that I haven't watched, except for the one lost in Carranza, King mm -hmm. State Board, Maine, where Pablo Carranza falls back into hard drugs despite his sobriety and battle. I watched that. But watching myself is like, oh my God, who is that geek? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I, but I have to. Um, but uh, yes, um, I gave a talk at the uh, first uh, quantified self conference, and uh, the next day they said, "Wow, that was incredible! Come back as the featured speaker um, on Sunday." So uh, you know, it's been uh, interesting how difficult it is to get this stuff off the ground. But um, we're still here, hooray! Um, and I am very. Uh, yeah, boy, when I talked with um, uh, Kevin of uh, Kevin Jones, he said, wow, you're not really focused on shipping this, aren't you? And uh, no, that's not, that's definitely the case. Um, it's, it started as a work of art, um, as a poetry project. And basically I am interested in the experience. Um, it feels to me that misinformation thrives on the separation of feeling and thinking and to put that together is an individual kind of instrument to play one's own mind and not everybody plays the piano or bassoon or or their own mind so it's it's that kind of intimacy which i 
it, which is a huge block, especially you know when we come to. I, I do think that uh, what is it? Uh, that a social memex is possible, but maybe we have to start smaller. And I have more questions than any um, answers. That's for sure. Mark, do you have a uh, if you could uh, pick a couple links of YouTube stuff and post them? Please, because I just oh, I just searched Mark Carranza on YouTube and I got zippity nada. I got like you're video. not interesting stuff. Me. Just click on videos. Click on videos. Well, there's Sorry. there's more Mark Carranzas than we need. There's a tab. I'm, <laughs> I'm in YouTube. Uh, oh, and not, I just, not YouTube. I just, it's, it, they're on Vimeo. Um, just go to a, oh Vimeo. I mean, yeah, I'm on a Google. I'm just on PlainGoogle.com. I oh. type in M A R K space C A R R A N Z A. And um, I click on the videos tab and I see the first two. Okay. Um, the first one is without uh, video because I didn't, I, I just, uh, we all have difficulties. And one of mine is it's so simple. It's just one thing connecting with another with a bi-directional link and you do that millions of times. <laughs> You know, why hasn't that been done by many people making billions of dollars who, who do that? But um, at the time in 2008, I didn't want it to be shown. And in 2013, um, I had no choice. Um, and so I will eventually watch the 2013 conference again. And um, I have been asked many times to make a video of it in use. And yes, yes, I will do that. But um, <sighs> um. <laughs> so, um, Mark, your problem could be solved very quickly if you're interested. We could set up a call where the whole goal of the call is to screen capture a Zoom call where you screen share you taking notes with MX. And then we could edit that to the shortest piece that you like, and you could use that wherever we could post it on YouTube for you. It's like, that's really simple to do. I, I understand. Um, one of the things I've tried to do and failed is to basically connect... Um, the video to um, one of the inputs of the Zoom. So while we are seeing this, you'd see my face, hi. And on one of the blocks, you would see um, the live um, video feed from the software. And I'll get to that eventually. Um, it's exceedingly frustrating here at the Internet Archive because, you know, there's, there's so many problems. And there's the notion that we have to solve these problems before we get to the good stuff. And uh, um, Brewster has recently uh, done something really fun, which is milk and cookies, but, you know, afternoon tea. And um, that's just, it cuts, it gives, it gives a sense of context, which it can often be missing in organizations. Um, you know, you got to have informal conversations. Hey, what are we doing right now? Um, and uh, so, you know, basically he's going that, yeah, we're doing, you know, interlibrary loan and we really need like a systems analyst to kind of come in and like talk to people and understand what their needs are. <laughs> but I'm doing incredibly detailed PHP software maintenance on 20 year old code and you can't do them at the same time. Um, so anyway, um, uh, let's. I'm I'm totally interested in hyper knowledge, just, and you know, uh, I don't want to uh, jump in the uh, agenda. Oh, it's in let's, the agenda. What is it? In the agenda. Okay. How about that? Uh, let's uh, let's hit real quick. Uh, who's got to leave when? Um, Vincent leave leave soon for dinner in Prague. Um, Mark uh, has. Uh, Mark is at his day job um, and has to do J Dub stuff probably by 10 or so, maybe a little earlier. Um, uh, and I think we should definitely hit hyper knowledge and project clam bake, and then maybe a little bit of what actually is flotilla. Um, but clam bake and hyper knowledge are probably the, the most important things. Um, so who needs to leave? I, if, if we need Vincent, we probably want to talk maybe about clam bake first. Um, although Wendy and Michael can, Michael to the extent that he is connected, um, can talk about Clambake too.
I can pop in real quick and then I'm going to have to run. Hello, everyone. So yeah, basically Project Clambake started. Uh, so Wendy McQueen and Michael and I um, actually got a chance to meet up in person uh, upstate New York a few weeks ago. And um, Michael Gross, Michael just left because he's offended. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 that, that I brought that up. <laughs> um, but yeah, basically we were talking about at the end of our like, you know, three, four hours together, like what would be a really cool action item in terms of like, what would we we'd be all really happy with that could happen in the, like realistically in the next few months. And we kind of all came to the consensus having a like working basically experiment of kind of connecting the various projects that we're working on and then just kind of like seeing how it goes and reevaluating. And so the plan was basically to um, hook up a, basically um, an information, we would pick one topic, uh, one specific thing like climate change or um, jazz music, and then basically have, um, basically design like a workflow or like a stream of information flows where it would go from, for example, Mattermost or Factor um, into then for example, Trove, where it could then be further kind of like tagged and categorized. And then from there exported into um, a sort of uh, Kumu-like mind map view um, where basically we could play around with different ways of visualizing the knowledge network that was created. And so it touches on, uh, you know, Michael's um, project factor, it touches on Trove, and it also touches on Wendy McLean's project, which is about visualizing data sets in a way that you can see the big picture and then also be able to make connections between the different pieces. So that was kind of how the project started. And that's still our, uh, I guess, goal. And, and we haven't really finalized or picked like what that topic is going to be. Um, and that's kind of where we're at right now. We wanted to pick something that wasn't too big like climate change, which we could have an, an entire, you know, Mark Trexler's brain is an example of how like, we don't want something that big, but we also don't want something so small that it's gonna be hard to actually, within a reasonable time scale, pull together information. Yeah, um, so to add on that, Vincent, you and I had talked about how the press conference, right, is has enough data. I keep thinking about how maybe we can still use that. So that's one idea, right? Take one event that's already on Trove and maybe add to it with factor streams and then, you know, visualize it with Kumu or something and just as just to do something. <laughs> so that has been, I've been mulling that over as a bit. Okay. Yeah, you like. Uh Wendy, do you want to talk about the press conference real quick? Yeah, I think Vincent can probably speak to it better than I, but I'll give it a shot. Um, I went for a little while yesterday, mostly because I was thinking in this way towards, you know, working on the Clambake project and just trying to get my head around what kinds of information was being shared and felt like if I was hearing it, I could, it would spark some visualizations for me and how I, how I would like to have it organized if I was an attendee. But then I was also fascinated by all the things that people were sharing. It was amazing, uh, the solutions and the insights and made some great connections, including uh, Marc Antoine. So that was lovely. It was not expecting that bonus. Um, and so excited to see where some of those new connections can go and how they fit into the bigger picture. And then, of course, um, weaving it all together those conversations happening more and more as well. So I'm really excited to see all these people together on this call today. And I have a feeling some good things can come out of this conversation today. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna have to run, but before I go, I'll just really quickly touch on Mark Antoine's comment. Um, and Pete, if you don't mind passing host to me for a second. Um, so I think the, the press conference was a really great way to basically get together as sort of network of conversations and just having people that have been having separate conversations together in a room. But of course, that's only the first step. And so how do we take it to the next level to actually, uh, now that we know about each other, right, get over all the, the fuzzy 
human and technical hurdles to be able to actually collaborate, which we definitely did not uh, have the ambition of even, even really touching on, besides, of course, providing a space that people are comfortable to share what they're working on and they you know, feel excited to be able to um, work more in the open. Uh, and the other aspect of it and why I kind of came in to help uh, with this specific press conference was we were trying to do it in a way that the knowledge that we were going to capture from the conference would have a longer shelf life than just that event. So how do we take, uh, for example, all the different projects and conversations and then be able to make it easy for people to connect to those two months from now or three months from now? And so on the event page, there are all the relevant projects that were created that are now linked to this event. And then there's also the different links that were shared during the press conference. We'll also be adding in the, the Zoom chat and having all the links that were shared in the Zoom chat on the event page for people to explore all the various things that we discussed and talked about. And then uh, linked resources. And of course the event agenda where anyone can go in and basically go to any of the presentations and then have a link either to the website or in the case of having an actual project on Trove, a link directly to the project. And we're hoping that uh, in the next few weeks, as we send out emails to everyone who attended, we're gonna ask anyone who added a project to basically add, you know, do you have an, a weekly meeting? Do you have an open house? Which is a, an idea that Jamie came up with that I love is like, everyone needs to have an open house, a one hour time slot once a week where you're meeting that people could show up. And Flotilla is kind of an example of, of that, you know, where we just have an open weekly meeting where people can show up. And I think it really helps collaboration and networking because it's a consistent recurring thing. You don't have to take that extra energy to actually schedule something. And so the idea with that is, is each project can have an open house. So when you go to the project page, you can just see like, okay, what's the upcoming event that is just open that I can go into and be able to connect with whoever is working on this project. And so that's kind of was one of the experiments we were trying to, to do and are still ongoing going to be doing over the next few weeks and seeing if this actually works as a way to organize knowledge in more of a connect interconnected way to be able to get people to connect and collaborate more. Yeah, and I'm just going to put an exclamation point on the idea again that we use this as our as our test case for clam bake. So Michael, I don't know if you saw that whole presentation and I don't think that Vincent just gave of the of the section of Trove that was for the press conference. Um, but I, I'm, I'm more and more convinced that it's a small enough yet big enough, yet complicated enough and interesting enough that it could benefit from a map view, that it could benefit maybe for some, from some extra resources suggested or added to the different projects or organizations, however we wanna do that, that it would be a great test case. Yeah, agreed. I didn't see the whole thing. Um, I'm sorry, having con connectivity problems. Um, but uh, yeah, <laughs> with you. Cool. I would say when Vincent comes back from Prague, we could maybe meet again or anybody else who's interested or, or, or take a flotilla call to really kind of break down some of the stuff or have a separate call or whatever. Sounds great to me. Uh, just to keep things rolling, um, is uh, what do people think about switching to hyperknowledge uh, with Marc Antoine? I, you know what? I wouldn't mind to have a good definition of flotilla before I start because I think it's interesting for me to con compare and contrast. Um, fair enough. Um, uh, I think flotilla will get discussed or, or described in different ways. I think. Um, it's it's kind of become a roundtable um, uh, intercollaboration um, space. Uh, so we have these uh, weekly calls, uh, Flotilla Fridays, um, at maybe not the best time for everybody. So uh, that's another kind of uh, item we might talk about uh, either during this meeting or more likely asynchronously on the chat channel. Um, Flotilla is the idea that um, uh, 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 people doing making, making things, um, uh, directories, uh, matchmaking tools, uh, knowledge-based tools, massive wiki. Um, 
uh, ought to get together and talk kind of in the way that you would talk in a uh, industry association, um, kind of uh, about how we can interoperate. Um, probably the core theme of Flotilla is interoperability and how can we make everything uh, work together, even though we've got separate projects. Um, one of the, the really generative things uh, for me, um, uh, Vincent and I are, are our, our early members, uh, Charles Blass is also an early member. Um, Vincent and I um, both love working together, love uh, doing stuff together, have have a blast when we're when we're working. Uh, we also have different takes on the way you organize information, you collect information, you, you help people use the information. Um, so Trove and Massive are something that can interoperate and we've worked on making them interoperate in different ways. Um, they're also something that take different philosoph philosophical approaches. Um, so um, uh, unlike many parts of the world, especially the US, um, I, I feel like we have these generative discussions in Flotilla about differences rather than um, fights or disagreements or things like that. Um, so I've got a lot of respect for the way Vincent uh, organizes things and Vincent's got a lot of respect for the way Massive Wiki works. Um, and they're just not, you know, exactly what we do. Um, uh, but when we come together and we're talking about those things, um, or you know, as it expands, you know, how do we fit factor into a syndication model where we can talk about profiles that are in factor and in Trove and in um, Massive Wiki? Um, that's been super generative. So I feel like it's got that interchange kind of feel. Um, it's a um, uh, in a different context. Mark and Tom, we talked about OGM being a laboratory. Um, Flotilla has a little bit of a lab feel, probably less than OGM maybe, but um, it's like we've got experiments we want to try together and, and we talk about them here. Um, project Clambake is actually a Flotilla project, which is kind of a new take on what Flotilla means. Um, uh, and I'm not sure actually what that means, but it, it seems to make sense. It seems to jive together, um, so I like it. Um, and uh, now, also with uh, hyperknowledge, uh, I think all of us would love to weave hyperknowledge into what we do. Um, I know that you know every time I'm talking with Wendy Elford or um, or Vincent or Wendy McLean um, talk or Jerry talking about how knowledge fits together, and it's like, oh, and this is the part that Mark Antoine has. Um, so trying to. There you go. Um, Mark, you have something to say before I start? Um, yeah, uh, a couple a couple short things. Um, I just Thank posted a uh, um, D Web, uh, it stands for Decentralized Web uh, Meetup on Tuesday. I uh, forget the time, but uh, probably in the middle of the day or in the morning. Um, there's many things that are going on, and I don't get to all of them. Uh, for example, uh, I would love to meet with. Vincent, uh, Wendy, and Michael um, in their in their talk. So invitation, open invitation, spam me with meeting invitations, and I will attempt to um, connect. Uh, and I will be happy to say no if it doesn't work for me. Um, uh, last thing, um, uh, Jerry uh, talked to Mark this morning, Mark Graham, um, uh, and yeah, he'd love to talk to the three of us or or even more. And so the last thing would be, hey, I'm at the Internet Archive, and the Internet Archive wants to be a resource. And certainly here we have a uh, uh, an informal group that um, none of you know about. Um, is a Memex group, and it's met for ten years uh, at various times. So anybody in the Bay Area, um, we're going to try to have another one. But if you need. Uh, the building to host something, um, we're very happy to, um, and even eager to to help out with that. Uh, again, um, <laughs> it's a fan <laughs> I'm just saying, if it's a secret Memex meeting, it would seem totally oh, it's, it's, it would seem it's totally appropriate. A, there's a uh, there's a Facebook group. Um, uh, well, that's so I much less invite. exciting than a sarcophagus. Yes. Um, <laughs> 
sour thought, I guess. Um, ah. But uh, um, anyway, I'll, I, I will leave here at uh, 9.50. Um, okay. But uh, totally interested in the hyper -knowledge. Thanks. Okay, so I think it's, I'll try to be not, not so succinct, but still succinct enough so I can go through. I want to give a bit of history uh, first. I, my first collective intelligence project was uh, what I now call Idea Loom, is a fork of something that was then called Assemble. It was about extracting, identifying emerging concepts in a conversation, in a web forum, to be exact. So basically, you had an uh, outline of emerging concepts that you could easily uh, gather, uh, gather from a web forum on the side. And then I realized, okay, what happens, the, the, the way it was used uh, by uh, the company in which I was developing it was very much, uh, we are selling the service of expert uh, curators to create the map, but then we don't want to touch the map and we don't want it to emerge too much because the clients were corporate clients and they were afraid of what would emerge. So it was like, no, this is wrong. We want, I want this to be emergent, but if it's emergent, what? The downside is that means it gives the curators too much power. And I want uh, something that is really helping people. Uh, here's how I see things, here are how, I see, how I see things, and can we compare that? So the idea was, my first idea was comparable mind maps. Uh, can we do a different merge between concept graphs? Uh, and the original uh, idea loom was very IBIS centric. But I was already uh, going beyond that in the sense, yeah, but when we refactor concepts, when we uh, compare two proposals to one another, then it's not a pro and a con. It's, a, it's a, actually a table of proposal versus criteria and uh, maybe an ordering within each criteria. Anyway, just, there's different views and ways to slice and cut a decision support system, which was what this is originally, but the more I looked at conversations, I realized so much conversation difficulty is about different viewpoints, different definitions, different ways of carving up the world. And what if the boundaries of the concepts are what is contentious? Uh, so IBIS has its value and I still very much believe in it and I'm working with Jack on an applic uh, IBIS application right now. Uh, but I am trying to look beyond that. And the notion of Concept identity is absolutely key. Uh, when you're doing massive collective intelligence, you have to be manipulating not one, but many networks. Uh, and, 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 and networks and not text. Text is designed for a continuous stream of one thought. I'm not saying text is bad, text is hugely valu valuable. We think in language. Uh, I don't, and, and you know, Peter, I agree, we don't, this is, this is not meant to be a against thing. Language matters, text matters. Uh, but I'm very much trying to say, if we're the models of collaborative edition on text are usually last edit wins. There's been a few attempts like mixed ink to have collectively design text, but it's very difficult. You need a lower level of granularity and a, a, a different, a more supple kind of structure than linear, uh, the linearity of text to have the possibility of a good many people uh, doing separate edits without merge issues and even not necessarily resolving the issues. And for me, that's very fundamental. Uh, if we're looking at collective intelligence, Difference is a fact of life. And uh, I was very much influenced by um, Mike Caulfield's uh, speech about choral explanations. There has to be many ways to explain something for different people because different people have different cognitive styles. There's not one right way to define something. And, but then what do you show, right? Well, you want to show the plurality and situate any statement or set of statements in, and, and, and it's, this is very much a fractal view, you know, there's individual concepts and claims around those concepts and arguments that organize those claims. Um, and each of those definitions, claims and arguments can be either consensual, polarizing or fringe. 
It's polarizing when a lot of people agree or disagree. It's strange when a few people agree. Uh, and it's consensus when most people agree and the, the people who disagree are French. Uh, and, and it's important to have the full map because sometimes the truth isn't the fringe, sometimes it isn't, but in deciding truth may be beyond scope, but certainly having a map of who, who says what, where do they differ, can they justify their difference, uh, is, the fringe, uh, is the fringe concept informed or uninformed? And then this ties into reputation systems and all kinds of other things, which are both outside and inside scope. So what is the boundary of hyperknowledge? Because right now I'm speaking about so many things, visualization and data. And in a way, uh, the ambition of hyperknowledge is very modest. It wants to be a protocol and a data format so that different tools, different visualizations, different uh, even ways of doing the evaluation can interoperate. But it is extremely ambitious in that scope because on the one hand, uh, the, the philosophy behind hyperknowledge is everything starts with state, you know, utterances, speech acts, if you will. The document is a speech act, of course. Uh, you're putting some something out either in a private or in a public discourse. S and then the public acts, Piercean interpret, uh, you know, there's the emitter and the receptor, and there's some vague correspondence between what you thought and what you said one way or another, and what people understood from it. Uh, the symbols and cons and symbols in speech, the acts again, spoken or written, or symbolic, formal, doesn't matter. Symbols are in correspondence with thoughts in our head, and it's a very loose in computer terms, many to many correspondence. We don't, we never have access to what's here, but we are trying to triangulate towards tighter and tighter uh, concept definitions with by trying to see, oh, is this what you mean when you say this? And that's what we do in speech. We negotiate, we negotiate the meaning of symbols uh, and we harmonize. Uh, Jack's favorite quote on this is, uh, most scientists would rather share a toothbrush than their vocabulary. Um, the, and that's fine. I don't think that imposing one ontology, one vocabulary to rule them all, I think that's an anti goal. The question is can we still have useful conversation with different ontologies and different um, concepts and different definitions by making explicit bridges? Oh, when this person says this, it means that and that. So with the speech act um, emphasis, I see each person as uh, managing one or possibly many speech act event cues. Uh, speech act event cues, I'm, I'm using event sourcing as a technological basis. These are things I've said. And then these are things that I've become aware of. Uh, and so my statement here may or may not be informed by what's happened in this other event here. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, and then the question is, how do, we mer how do we get community understanding out of that, right? And this is where different communities may or may not want, but I assume they usually will want to say, well, this is what our community thinks about a certain thing. So can the community would be aware of the individual event queues and say, well, of these many things that are said by many members, by whatever social process we decide, could be vote, could be consensus, could be plurality, it's, that's a community choice. This is what the community proposes as this is the community's view. And then you can repeat that across different supra communities. And this is a arbitrary lattice, right? Uh, the, we're speaking about having uh, a federation of community um, streams, idea streams each with their own vocabulary, but each specifying in their stream, oh, 
this term is equal to that term over there, and this term is equal to that term over there. So at the federation level, we're beginning to be able to say, okay, what do most people say about this? And we're able to say what most people say because we want to, I want to favor uh, synthesis. If somebody says this definition is a synthesis of that definition and that definition, and the people supporting the different definitions acknowledge it, that's an important condition because otherwise there can be, uh, and a lot of the difficult thinking is the strategic thinking, right? Uh, people will want to sabotage this if it becomes important. Uh, but let's say we have acknowledgement of this is a valid neutral point of view definition, then it becomes uh, encompassing and more uh, favored in the federation view of what the concept is. Uh, and then so we'll have the divergence of multiple streams and, but with explicit, um, the algorithms would favor anything that helps understand the bridges and the synthesis between different concepts. And there's, by the way, I'm hand waving a lot here. Uh, there's a lot here that is clear in my head and there's a lot that is explicitly unclear in my head. The voting mechanisms is something I'm banging my head against right now. But what the voting mechanisms is something I'm banging my head against right now. But what is clear to me is that when we're speaking about interoperation, uh, and I believe strongly in interoperation because each document is an event stream. Each, if I make a hypothesis, I'll probably want to make a substream for, oh, well, supposing this, then what are the consequences? That's another stream with, which has to be internally coherent, but is not necessarily coherent with what I believe otherwise or in general. Uh, these are streams. Now, when we're speaking about, sorry, I lost my thread a bit. Oh, yeah. Concepts are, concepts boundaries are disputed. I said that earlier. I may say, oh, when I say this, this is the same as when you say that, you may disagree. No, no, they're distinct according to this. So identifiers, oh yeah, interoperability. We have, it's easy to have a hash, a name of the snapshot of an idea. That's not a problem. When we have a name of an idea as it evolves, the question, is it the same idea? Like this is the, the problem of, uh, uh, Jason's ship, right? When you change a plank, when you change the mast, when you change the sail, is it the same ship? Ship. Uh, well, when you change definition, when you refine the definition, is it the same concept? At one point, is the evolution of the concept make it a different concept? I would argue that, for example, when we speak of Uh, Mark's definition, uh, Bernie Sanders' definition, or Mike McConnell's definition are almost unrelated, except historically, of course. Uh, and yet there is a kind of common core to what they mean by that, but it's very thin. Um, so being able, to, and, and, and even if we try to be more formal about it, the any concept at some point will realize, oh, it, may be ambiguous or we, we may be changing how we think about it with as new knowledge arrives. So is there a continuous identity? We can have an identity of the concept, but then it splits and it merges and there's all these flows to concept identity. Um, and so on the one hand, when we're interpreting with other systems, most systems are defined with clear, unambiguous concepts. If you look at a semiotic web, if you look at uh, its concept as a URL, the URL is, uh, designates the concept, that's unproblematic. Okay, what does faux friend mean? We all know how contentious the notion of friendship has become uh, in various definitions. It's different people will use it in different ways and that's up to a point, fine. It's an ambiguous concept, it's valid as such. Yes, the illusion of clear category, thank you, Mark. That's exactly it. And so it's a, for me, uh, interoperability is about making some of those links very explicit. And that means there will be things in the streams that are macro objects like this document was published or this post was made in Slack. 
it's a stream. From the hyper-knowledge st standpoint, those are very ambiguous because natural language, statements, uh, communication events, and somebody may decide if it's, if it's important to them to say, okay, actually this person is speaking about this concept and this concept, and this is the claim being made. And so interpret the claim, propose an interpretation, which the original author may or may not agree with. Or somebody making a statement may already propose some elements of interpretation. Not everything, it's too much work. Nobody will do it. The, the, the point is to do it at need. The, the, the one thing, one group I'm involved with is working a very uh, a lot on this formalization thing. And one thing we all agreed with at the, at the start is full formalization is difficult. We have to accept progressive partial formalization. So have this interaction between whatever platforms exist that have their own publication streams. And uh, the question is, does it have history? And that way the work of archive is important because web pages do this horrible thing of uh, using an identifier for a web page, which is mutable. Uh, IPFS tries to say, no, let's only have immutable objects, but we want to know that we're making a reference to a certain ver version of that. So that way, archiving is important, but wouldn't it be better if each website kept mass versions? Uh, there's protocols for that, uh, which aren't used. Um, but what is important to me is can somebody translate that arbitrary event field, or it could be the massive field, or it could be the trove field. Structured data is something else. Text is something else. And concept maps are something else. What I'm interested in, can we map concept maps to those other communication acts and say, here's a, fee, here's a stream that contains interpretations by one or by many persons of the concept in this more traditional media field. Uh, media stream. And then we can ask, okay, what's being said about this? And that what's being said about this means looking through the federation, not only about statements about this concept, but statements that have been claimed by somebody to be equivalent to this concept. Uh, so there will probably be uh, servers, federation functions, whether it's done centralized or decentralized, or most probably hybrid. Uh, I think I definitely want to do a lot of this decentralized eventually. I think I will start with some centralized at some point because of the volume involved. But certainly the notion is, can we have a picture of the semantic neighborhood of a concept as identified and distinguished by people saying, Yes, this is the same idea. No, it's different because those are the key events, right? And this is a slightly clearer definition, or this is an alternate definition, and it's clearer to me. And it's, so these are the key events in the stream. It's about saying these are the same ideas, these are the same. And then you can go into the higher levels, say this concept is used in this claim, this claim is used as uh, opposing or a rebuttal of this other claim, and all the structure for uh, higher level thinking, and then claims maybe about facts, about desires, plans, actions, all this is relevant again. But for example, to go back to Trove, uh, Trove doesn't have to do all this, and it's perfectly legitimate because most it's mostly dealing with people, events, organizations whose identity is not problematic, mostly. It's slightly sometimes, you know, people leave or, or, or join an organization, but so being part of an organization is time bound and rarely, but sometimes contentious. Uh, but mostly these are well established identities, and that's 99% of what the world needs. But I'm very interested in this 1% where people are arguing over what does this mean? And when you're saying, this is a bad idea before because that, or we should do these projects together because they have the same aim. Okay, what is the exact aim? Or do you have presuppositions in your action plan that this action will lead this result that I may or may not share, or maybe we we can find the missing piece and what is what else is needed to make 
this action lead, yield this result. And these are the difficult, more difficult conversations which require this kind of concept alignment. So I work much less, less than I wanted, but a bit on visualization because that interests me. For me, that's another scope, let's be very clear. But what is very in scope is beyond the semantic web, a representation of meta claims, claims about claims. This is not the same concept. This is because, here, here's how they differ. This is possibly the same con concept. No, it's not true that this is not the same concept. These are meta claims. Uh, what is it for? It is for alignment. When I said projects trying to find alignment, Trove is doing one level of it about saying this is where we, I want to do this, you want to do this, or I need this, you need this. But is it really the same thing? The devil's in the detail. And some of that I'd like to be able to express at a more detailed level. So that's one aspect. And the other aspect is sense, collective sense making. We, I believe, we are able to think better as a collective. Uh, many, we're, we're turning, we're having so many repetitive arguments because each of us has to individually refute trolling or individually ponder complex issues. Can we central, uh, not centralize, but federate all the work of debunking, all the work of synthesizing, all the work of explaining so that I can look at one concept and say, okay, I don't understand this. What am I missing? Or I understand this. What else is there around it that I haven't seen? That is the why and the how is all this complex work about identity because the this is always more contentious than it looks. So that's basically the plan. Streams in sh distributed index on the streams so we can have uh, concept neighborhoods obtained through collaborative definition of concept neighborhoods. Now, there's going to be many specific applications. As I said, I'm working with Jack on a specific application on gamifying uh, collective sense making. Uh, that's another project. It's not using the full hyper knowledge apparatus because the full hyper knowledge apparatus is not ready. Uh, but you see what I'm trying to do and how it, uh, it's certainly one key, key, key operator is broadening the notion of identity. We all have to accept that not everything has a stable identity. Identity is negotiated. And when we speak about entities or ideas, idea and entity is problematic, problematized. And doing that in a collective fashion and being able to say, how do we do it collectively? And by the way, last thing before I leave uh, or, or leave the microphone, I believe a lot, I see a lot of activity on. Uh, tools for thought, which are text-based. And again, that's not what I'm doing, uh, but it's extremely useful. And the question of collaborative editing in that context also, I think it's important to go beyond the last edit wins as we have in Google Docs. I think it should be possible to say, well, this is how I would extend that list. No, this is how I would extend that list. Okay, how do we, like for example, many Rome likes are doing listicles as a basic operator. That's a conversation I had a lot with Jerry Lagos, uh, who's using listicles, but who's also using a kind of semantic la layer above listicles. Um, being able to have a collaborative editing that enables, here are many contentious versions of this uh, knowledge unit, whether it's expressed as text or knowledge graph, formal, semi-formal, shouldn't matter. We have individual knowledge units and we have contentious versions of them. The collective editing on a large scale is not about last edit wins. It's about, okay, we have all these versions. Let's, let's look at them side by side and try to negotiate synthesis. And this is, um, this to is totally part of what hyperknowledge is about. Okay, I hope questions. Um, really quickly before I go, I threw uh, my utterance notes, um, which are stored as utterance events with a uh, person in time into the uh, HackMD. 
And basically, um, I have been, you know, the real uh, notion of the huge knowledge um, graph of mankind, I call it pan-sophia, which basically means all wisdom and the roots of panic and Sophia um, from the Greek. So uh, I love what you said, Mark. <laughs> I so look forward to uh, um, talking because I've certainly uh, mapped out um, a lot of uh, um, data structures and progressive layering, how things can be uh, more complete, um, both formal and informal. Um, love everybody here, um, Bill um, and Michael. Gosh, I would love to talk to you more. Um, Jack, gosh, it's great to see you. Um, uh, boy, um, <laughs> have a great, have a great meeting. Gotta go. Take care. Thanks. Uh, the I wish I had concrete questions. Bill, you say you have questions. Ask if what's your most burning question now? <laughs> Go for it. Okay, the one that came up for me. Um, is in grounded from my own personal experience, especially with the Zen Buddhist practice. In terms of collective knowledge and sharing, coming to shared understanding, I mean, I've recently been tackling some things I haven't really looked at. And all I can tell you is that for me, understanding is something personal, individual, that I need to accomplish for myself before I can stand up and say, let's talk about set theory or whatever. So there is this odd, even in Zen Buddhism about, you know, one is really working with oneself, even if there is no self, and we are all one, as Spinoza said, one big connected nature. That's it, nothing else we still as humans, at least those of us educated in the, the West, I'll say in North America, have to come to terms with our, come to terms with things personally in order to understand them. So this idea about having a group of people share an understanding, it sounds easy to say, but sometimes as you point out, it takes, can take a lot of work to accomplish, and even though, I mean, my wife's a conversation analyst, and the thing we learn as humans, you know, everybody says, oh, I can't do stand-up, I can't do ad-lib, it's like we do it every day. Because in a conversation, we do not know what the person is gonna say next. Could be anything. So uh, there's something here that I think, I don't know, but that's, my one question, it's a question for me about when you talk about collectives, I mean, in the psychodynamics of groups, there really is like, you know, there is no group, there's just a room filled with people. Even though We're all a group connected. of people can enact or behave or fool themselves or whatever. So I think I'll stop there. The, okay, this, this is something I'm also contending with. Uh, this is not at all, um, it's a difficulty I try to be aware of, uh, though it's true that I have taken a deliberately pseudo-rationalistic stance of knowledge has to be there and let people deal with it. I do think many things. One is I think that working together on a shared knowledge representation, and I'm not speaking about the global thing. I think that one intermediate layer that's extremely important and that I did gloss over is there's you know the individual topics and connections between topics, and there's what I called curated views. You know, it's like okay, let me tell you what. I think as a person about a field, a subfield of knowledge. And these are the, this is the subnetwork that I think one needs to understand to understand a certain point of view. So that's an individual or 
collective, sometimes it could be collective perspective, but because it could be an organization saying, here's the position of the FAA on whatever policy, for example, that's a curated view as well. But the idea is documents, text and or uh, knowledge graphs, they're a certain viewpoint. And the process of building such a curated view, I think, is how one uh, comes to grasp a certain complex issue. Uh, what I aim to do is to make sure that when someone creates a curated view or reads a curated view, you can easily say, okay, how does that viewpoint, which is necessarily one point of view, how does it embed itself in the broader community set of beliefs? And so it's about resituating curated views, which I think are primordial when you're learning, when you're teaching, or when you're sense-making. You're crafting a coherent view. We all try to maintain a coherent view of our own knowledge. And, but then how does it fit in something broader so that we can try growing our understanding? And this is an individual process, but it's also, I believe, tools can help to make it a collective process. Whenever we're talking, we're negotiating our common view. Uh, I'm, I'm enough of a, not only a Buddhist, but a bit of a systemist. There's no such thing as a self, right? Uh, what I am and what I believe in the patterns of my being exists in my interaction with those around me in my environment. I exist through in my interactions. In that way, the knowledge lives between us. And, and if we can have, what we have developed with speech is a one-to-one -one, or with media is a one-to-many and up to a point with hypertext, many-to-many, -many, but it's very fraught and there's all kinds of weird dynamics around it. So these are modes of harmonizing. And what I want is a higher scale many-to-many -many, where the acts of harmonization we do, which are hard work, are, of course, somebody else rereading the act of harmonization has to make sense of it for themselves. It's not transparent. But hopefully, as you identify, this is really what helped me understand this concept, and you make that into a curated view, and it gets adopted by others and have voted, the next person trying to understand will say, well, okay, this is the easiest entry point into that controversy because people on both sides have claimed to have gained something from entering it through that curated view. Uh, you're muted stuff. I agree with you completely about the entire thing. I just say personally, my own question is how is this related to my own personal understanding and participation, which I do not have any answer for that right now, but it's still a question, but I agree with what you have said and laid out. And I think it's, you know, we don't have an alternative. It's super, in a way I look at, I've been reading about the history of the world between 1780 and 1914. It's like, well, we got to keep going. because I don't have an answer either. What I have is a research program. Let's put it that way. Um, this almost feels like a, a side a side tangent, but it, it's not. Um, I dumped a bunch of stuff into the chat about uh, a neurophysiologist uh, named William Calvin. I think he's from uh, University of Washington or something like that. Um, and 10 or 20 years ago, he, he kind of had an explanation for the way human brains think. Um, and uh, uh, his view is that uh, cortical columns uh, are the, the unit of um, conscious, su subconscious, unconscious, and subconscious thought. Um, and the way it works is cortical columns will start to resonate on a certain thing. He used a very simple example, like um, 
you're perceiving something and your brain is trying to figure out if it's a banana or an apple. So some of your cortical columns will start going, it looks like a banana to me and other cortical columns will going up, apple, apple, apple. And uh, the, the cortical columns recruit neighbors um, in a chorus, uh, just like a chorus. So these choruses are singing at each other and at the edge, um, uh, they fall over, one falls over towards banana or one falls over towards apple. Um, as you know, it, it thinks about it a little bit more and listens to its neighbors. And at some point, the whole thing, um, so there's a natural selection process going on there. And then the whole thing collapses into, oh, that's an apple. Of course, it's an apple. And that's the point at which your, your brain actually is thinking, uh, ah, apple. Um, so there's some resonance uh, for me, uh, Mark Antoine, in the way that you're talking about um, hyperknowledge. Um, uh, it, it seems a lot like, uh, you know, um, concepts as, as cortical columns or something like that, or, or people as cortical columns and, and um, having the ability to recruit um, uh, against, a, you know, an uncertainty and negotiate a, a choir going, uh, yeah, it's an apple. I see what you're saying. Um, yeah. The, the, I've been resisting neural analogs a lot because my analog is very much human communication and the, 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 the semiotic transmission. Uh, but it is true that there is something in the way cortical columns do lateral inhibition that is not unrelated to the way I describe distinctions. When I say this concept, well, it looks like this concept, but there's really a difference. That's a kind of lateral inhibition saying, you know, those are not exactly the same or those are the same. And let's actually, everything that is claimed about one concept should apply to the other concept. Um, and that is, yeah, totally the point of hyperknowledge, being able to say, oh, they're saying this about this. We're saying this about that. We're talking about the same thing. Let's connect or the other way around. It sounds like the same thing, but you know what? Maybe not. <laughs> that is what making those conversations explicit is. I've never seen it. I, and I can't believe how uh, so much work on data representation and so little work on data meta representation. I can't believe yeah. it. Yeah, it's striking. Yes, <laughs> Minsky. <laughs> um, very strangely, um, I just gifted my mom's wardrobe to some friends who gave me this as a gift. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, yeah, Society of Mind. It's like, yeah, that, that's where we are. And it's lying at my feet. And I don't have a lot of books around in this little flat. I should so. reread it. <laughs> yeah, it's one I, I, I had that same thought. I, I, I don't think I've ever read it. So I need to actually read it. Wendy? Wendy. Um. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to catch the thread of my thought. I really appreciate having this conversation, first of all. I, don't, I haven't found yet that many people are talking about what you termed, and I appreciate the term as well, of like the fringe of conversation, right? Or concept understanding. And, and that is definitely where I have been living. I sort of backed into a want to map things and an eagerness to map things to assist with those conversations. And then backed up further to say, well, to get there, we need some other things first, right? We need to be able to have first just the knowledge store. So to say, this is generally what we agree on, right? This is generally the knowledge that we know, even though we know that's malleable and will change, but like, can we at least just have a platform for a discussion? Okay, yes, here's the platform, then let's have a discussion. And then how do we enable in a technical space and a digital space and an asynchronous space to continue these discussions with the hope that we can create more faster, that we can innovate more faster to solve the problems that are plaguing us that we don't seem to be able to get over, right? So that, that for goal. me, yeah, <laughs> that for me was the motivation for the visual. The visual is simply for me, the best thing I have come up with so far in my mind as the most frictionless, and I was talking about this yesterday too, the most frictionless way to get from 
the average person anyway, to get them from, um, I'm curious about something, or I need to, I need to solve a problem for my own life to, oh, that was super helpful. And, oh, here's this thing that someone else shared. And that was helpful. And maybe I'll share something that's really easy for me to share. And then working towards relearning how to collaborate because we've all taught each other not to. So having that platform to get us to the point where we are even willing and feel safe and brave enough to have those conversations, then being able to maybe provide boundaries as you were describing around organizations or certain groups of people or where you feel safe to talk or explore certain concepts together, play with them really, and let things go out there, put question marks around things, have leading questions at that fringe. You're not necessarily going to have that conversation with everyone in every, right, even our personal lives. This is who I am with this group. These are the kind of things I talk about over here, but not over here. So to have these kind of in-between spaces, and then there's the public sphere version of it. And yes, how can we get there faster? <laughs> yes. Thank you for, for holding space and doing such great work right at that edge, right at that messy, fuzzy, crazy edge. Yeah, I, I thank you. Uh, I've been thinking about this for a long time. Uh, at times I felt stalled. So it's like, what work? I haven't done anything. <laughs> but the, the, I've been progressing on this, but very slowly. And the question is how to make it faster because yes, I shared a concern. Uh, and certainly being able to discuss it always helps, being able to say, how does this fit in with other things? But at some point, I have to sit down and code, as Peter was reminding me recently. Uh, but I've always been, I need to know what other people's needs are so that I make sure that what I do is useful and usable. And the problem is, I'm so much thinking of the edge cases and a kind of superset of everything, that there is a real danger for me of creating something that's rich enough and complex enough that nobody will want to use it. And that's one other leg of the uh, multi-pronged analysis paralysis I'm working with. <laughs> uh, I see all the ways in which most existing si systems are too simple to do what I want. Uh, and so I've been very much resisting the release early, release out, and no, 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 I want to get the basics right because, God, I've done it wrong before and I know what doesn't work there. <laughs> Don't tell me to do this fast. No, I know how to do it fast and it fails miserably. Uh, but on the other hand, at some point I have to say, okay, this is, uh, I know that there has have been versions in my journey that were too complex and usable. I think I've gone, back to what I think is a level of balance, uh, but I'm still struggling with what happens with uh, when concepts have a disputed identity and we don't have one identifier or the identifier does not correspond to the disputed identity boundary because it's disputed. Okay, what does that look like when I make an API call? <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous, but it's the first question I need to be able to answer. And I'm getting closer to that answer at this point. And then I can start worrying again about questions that interest me much more, such as how will this look to an end user? And I have again, partial work on this, <laughs> but it's been stalled because I don't know what it looks like as a data structure. I'm getting there. It's uh, help, uh, being able to have these discussion helps, no question. And that way, if, uh, if there's space for that, French stuff in Flotilla, I'd be very happy. Uh, I do think Flotilla, or, or at least uh, Clambake is looking at primarily at an easier case, which is valid and important and blah, blah, blah. I don't want to say it's not like things with clear identities are important entities and we need to get those federated as well. And that way Flotilla uh, Trove is doing good work and Flotilla's tackled a useful project, but is this interface with fuzzy concepts part of the agenda? And are you willing to let me drive you on that pretty wild loose chase? It's, it's because it is a wild loose chase because it is very 
hand wavy. Uh, what are we looking at exactly? We're looking at the fuzziness. Yeah, just if you don't mind, Jerry, I just want to bounce off that. Thanks. Um, yes, for, for me, that fuzzy edge is the goal, yes, is the, is the prize, too. if we can get it right, too. Yep. And um, it's the magic, it's going to be the magical space, right, where, where, where new things happen. And, um, and the more I thought about it, and the more, and, and when Vincent and, and um, Michael and I got together, the more we were like, okay, but let's start somewhere. And, and for me, I don't know if you felt this way, but I've definitely felt this way. I'm trying to talk in that, in those spaces and finding that people need a visual people. It helps people to either have a use case or a visual or something. And so I started going, okay, let me go with visual. And of course I'm, I have been searching through everything that's already out there because similar to you, I don't want to draw it. I could draw it in Photoshop, but the level of detail and complexity that I know needs to be in there to truly get across the idea, I would be on Photoshop for a month just to create one mock-up. I can do that. If I, if I have to, I'll do that. I'm really trying hard not to. So I, I'm having a I'm lot of arguments. You. Sorry, Jerry. I'm having a lot of arguments with people who are doing uh, either 3D or bubbles and arrows or presentation of concept graphs. And I'm like, those, when they're big enough to be interesting, they become hair, well, hair balls. Uh, we need other representations. Uh, it's not working. And so I'm working on much simpler uh, matrix-based, uh, adjacency matrix-based representations of connectivity. Jerry. Love this conversation. Um, so in case it's inspirational to you, Marc-Antoine, um, the place, so here's, uh, I have this on my pin board, which means these, these thoughts at the top never change unless I change them. So I always have the current year, but I have a thought called my beliefs. And under here, this is kind of a hairball. It's a little messy, but if you go one by one, you'd be like, oh, okay, I sort of get it. So one of my beliefs is that humans need to be heard before they will listen. Like one of our problems is we're always busy trying to talk to people and we're not actually hearing them. And sometimes people just need to get something off their chest when they need to feel authentically heard, which is its own thing that actually means something. Um, and, and so this is a belief of mine and you could contrast it with other approaches. Like we're just gonna give everybody the answers and you know let them sort it out or whatever. But I'm really interested in how your work on claims nests into and enhances the stuff I've been sort of working on here. and. As we, um, so, so as my brain gets, you know, my brain is already exported as a bag of JSON objects. Um, if it gets imported into Factor, into Massive, into MX, into any other tool, I, 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 like I, I would love for this to happen. Like, is it then useful for you as some kind of texture to weave into with the claims and other sorts of assertions? Because I also have in my brain, Many, but not all, like like uh, Bill Calvin's book, uh, what was in my brain, but sort of in a really, really old link to like his book text on the web. And I've never read the book. So the idea about cortical columns and all that was kind of not in there, but is interesting as one representation of how the brain works, which might be how we store a fact, which is, you know, a whole, I'm going, I'm just trying to pick anything to go deep on because a claim can sort of in some weird, interesting way, be, be, be clicked back into some underlying beliefs or facts. So, so one, of my, one of my beliefs under my beliefs is that people are born good. And it's perfectly legitimate to believe that people are born evil. In fact, original sin says exactly that, as far as I can tell. And I think that is a hideous marketing strategy that really worked. Um, and so I can't stand original sin. An original blessing by Matthew Fox was one of the few works that I found opened a tiny door where I could sort of peek through and go, what? Like, man. Um, anyway, so I can, I can scaffold down for a lot of beliefs, like assume good faith is based on people are born good. Most of them are trying to figure out how to be good. And I have a whole bunch of thoughts about what makes people not act well and not act in their own interest and whatever, whatever, behavioral economics, uh, the, 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 story, the narratives in our heads, there's like millions. And this is really unfortunate because there are millions of complicating factors for why we don't behave sort of logically or, or whatever else that 
in some ideal world would be represented in your tool, Marc Antoine, in your environment as a series of claims and influences on the claim. Like, like if there's multiple worlds and windows and perspectives that inform my thinking on any one thing, in a perfect world, you could spin out many of those and actually elaborate them and follow those threads down to the last turtle. And that sounds really, really hard and like a big ball of twine and oh my God, right? But, but I, in the brain, I'm able to, I've got a lot of these turtles, like, and they're individually stacked and, and they're not, I'm not zooming in or out. I, I really don't like 3D either. I'm glad Julian's not on the call. He'd be like, but wait, um, but because I, because I, because I've, I've looked at a bunch of things that have a Z axis and they don't work. You can't actually navigate around information when it's floating around you like stars in a galaxy. They just don't work. Um, and so how this works is really interesting and important. And uh, before Bill leaves, I'd love Bill to be able to have a word. Uh, but I just wanted to show you that if at any moment you want to have a conversation about what, what are the nodes, where should I look, and how do I click into this asset? And if that's interesting to you, I would, and I'll just add before passing the mic to Bill, I would love to fund a project, which is the thing I'm trying to do, that feeds you to do that. Go ahead, Bill. I have quite a well, few. I just, I, I really have to go. I just, this has been a very wonderful, generative, uh, um, open ended conversation. I think we need to have many more. Um, and, uh, I don't know what to say, except I just really need to do a lot more work. There's, in a way, although we had much needs to be done and it looks like there's no time and everything's gonna fall apart. I, you know, for all, I, I, don't, um, I don't know what, you know, I don't know. I'm happy to be alive, whatever it is right now. So, and especially with all of you. So till next time, thank you all. Thank you for the Pema quote, Jerry. And yes, I hear you, I hear you. It's, I'm also worried, who isn't? Um, well, this is what I feel like and I have to offer. So I'm still, I keep doing it <laughs> even at the pace I'm at. <laughs> uh, we all do what we, Think we can do. Um, oh, hello back, Michael. Or were you gone or were you just off camera? I, I was off camera, but I've been here. Okay, good. Uh, I'll try to, to answer Jerry quickly. I don't know if I have a quick answer to that. Uh, on the definitely, specific... definitely don't expect a quick answer to like that hairball no, question. No, but uh, the, 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 uh, first on the underlying question, because that's a quick one. Uh, I think we are both local and global optimizers. Uh, and we're, uh, I don't think it's about all the reasons why we're not globally optimizing. It's we both have, we all have both tendencies. Uh, the question is how much do we cultivate global optimization, which is hard work. And, and how do we define the scope of global? And that's another total fascinating question. Anyway, the, the more, uh, the, the real underlying question is, can I use this? Uh, on the one hand, it's data, I can use it. On the other, not directly. Uh, the, in the sense that hyper knowledge becomes useful when you're able to make the uh, qualified links between concepts, saying this concept is different from this one in that way. This concept is the same, uh, is possibly the same as this one, there's wider the same. This concept is a premise of this one or reinforces this one or attacks this one. These are qualified links. I know that what we have in your brain is mostly unqualified links. Uh, it's not that it's not useful because it's a guide to where we would want to create the qualified links. And sometimes we could use whatever techniques to, like it would be absolutely valid to put this in GPT-3 and ask, you know, this is related to that because, <laughs> <laughs> and see what GPT-3 comes up with. Uh, I don't know. I'm not and in the process, we could actually send the results to a, 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 gra a, a graphics algorithm and then sell the NFT to fund the whole project. Keith, does that work? <laughs> and then just lather, rinse, repeat. We're done. 
uh, uh, or, or all these other, uh, you it's know, like a water wheel. IBM is working a lot on uh, projects for identifying arguments in text. Uh, this is not what I'm doing. Uh, they have means and capacity I don't have. It's fascinating work. I'm certainly focusing on human intervention, saying this is related to that because, be A, because I, well, for me, if it's going to be used as a basis for collective decision system, and for me, the end goal is deliberative democracy, it means it has to be auditable. And that means anything that is pure uh, black box machine learning is out. I'm not saying and it is out and it isn't. I have no problem with uh, such systems being part of the ecosystem and giving suggestions and augmenting human intelligence. But I certainly don't want to see any decision taken that cannot be traced to a human being somewhere, uh, which is another concern. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so can I use this? Yes and no. Uh, and I hope that helps understand certain of the issues about what hyperknowledge is and isn't. I'd, I'd like to break in meta uh, for a sec. Uh, I, I think I should leave uh, soon. Um, and I wonder if y'all want to keep con uh, conversing um, uh, or if we should reconvene another time. I love this conversation, but I also have a thing I need to finish today to get out. So I'm good folding this conversation, just looking forward to another one. Yeah, I have to leave in five, so same for me. Um, me too. I think it, it's an, uh, sorry, Michael. Um, uh, I think it's an interesting question, actually, whether whether this conversation is Flotilla global or Flotilla local. Uh -oh. um, it, it may be a project within Flotilla, um, uh, kind of the way Project Clambake is is a sub of Flotilla. Um, and there's uh, I th there's a there's kind of a larger and both larger and smaller focus for Flotilla, which is just you know how do we get our interoperation between knowledge systems um, and uh, and we don't need that conversation to go pretty deep. Uh, we need that conversation to go reasonably quick, I think, actually. Um, uh, so I I don't want to weigh one way or the other. I think we should just keep having this conversation, and, and I think it'll kind of sort itself out. Um, the other thing that I, I'm really sensitive to is um, the ability for people to be here based on time. Um, I know that parts of this conversation um, are really missing Wendy Elford and vice versa. Um, and her day starts around 1 or 2 p.m. Pacific. Um, uh, and I'm sure there are other people too. So my, my best guess at that is, is having some kind of thing where, where either um, maybe every week or two, um, we kind of have a vote and get most people um, a, a good spot, um, or we have something that processes around, around the clock over the weeks or something like that. I, I haven't... I've been thinking about having my own, I'm part of so many uh, spaces and I've been thinking of just creating my own space so I yeah. can discuss this. Yeah. And then I could invite all the Flotilla people and all the CDL, you know, all these other groups too. There's, there's definitely a part of hyperknowledge that is really important to Flotilla. Um, so I, I even, I, I think having your own space would be great. And we would still love to have the hyperknowledge thing represented in the the mix that's flotilla. Um, so I think both of those can can work. Uh, uh, certainly, one thing I hope is that as you think of interoperability, you think about okay, what happens when there's no fixed identifier, mm -hmm. so that at some point you'll be able to. <laughs> the good good news, bad news. Um, you'll you'll laugh. Um, Massive Wiki doesn't particularly like fixed identifiers. <laughs> so there. Um, Michael, did you want to jump in before we wrap this call? I was just going to say something about the meeting times, um, just because it was a live issue saying that as somebody who's usually Eastern, I have no problem with the meetings being later in the day. If that become, I know that's bad for Marc Antoine, right? I'm I mean, Eastern. Huh? Oh, I'm okay. Eastern. Oh, okay. So you can go later in the day too. Sure. 
Cool. Yeah, maybe we can do them in afternoons to accommodate Wendy and other folks who might join in. Cool. Sure. It's been a lovely conversation. Thank you all. And and the start of lots more, I hope. Yeah, let's stay in touch. I think you two have my email, Michael and Wendy. Um, Wendy, I'm not sure we've got. Uh, that's me. Um, so I think we need to talk some more just to like share these visions. Cool. Um, I'll post the notes in the recording. Not, not later. a comma. <laughs> no, co no comma. Yeah, replace the comma. That good, will end you in the wrong confuse, galaxy. Uh, good way to confuse the bots. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Cheers, all. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you.